Hi, everyone. It's Mark Thurman with the MIT Connected Things Conference. We're now working on our second edition of or our work from home edition, and we've kicked off uh, a series of uh, panels, one of which uh, my good friend David Pausner, a Boston area IP lawyer, is going to describe. So again, I want to thank you for participating. Keep an eye on the Enterprise Forum of Cambridge uh, pages for updates about our conference and uh, all of this content. David? Yeah, so thanks, Mark. I just got uh, off of a, um, a recording session with uh, three folks in the AI area. So we've got a, a, a webinar coming up as Mar part of Mark's series called uh, Industry 4.0, Artificial Intelligence, Is It Really? Um, we've brought in uh, Bob Lamkin, who's a former venture capitalist, and it was with the old. It was at the old Synaptic, I believe that was it. Wasn't it? Synaptic? No, Symbolics. Symbolics. Symbolics, um, which was an early, early which AI. Just up the road from where we're sitting right now in Kendall Square. Right. Actually, we're at. Uh, for there. those who recognize, we're at uh, CIC right now. Cambridge Innovation Center. Yep. And uh, we have as two other guests, co-founders of a company called Nirala, which is a Boston area AI company. And that's Max Versace and um, his uh, wife, Heather Ames, both out of the Boston University AI Lab. And they're going to, together, what we talked about, because we've already done the, the recording session, uh, we talked about a little about the technology of artificial intelligence, cool. um, without going too deep, and the history of AI, because uh, as you and I both know, at our ripe young ages, um, there have been many uh, sort I, of versions. Something's ripe. I'm just not sure what it is. <laughs> yes. There have been many, many versions of AI and a lot of hype over the years. Yes. And um, so we talked about that. And then why the AI now is likely to stay. And is it really any different than what was before, what we saw before uh, when you sort of tear away the hype? So it was actually a great session. We um, really welcome you to uh, joining the session. Yep. If I'm not mistaken, it'll play right after this intro. It, it'll, it'll play right after this. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. So the topic today, and uh, there will be largely just an open discussion amongst the, the panelists, and I'll try to shut up to the extent I can, but the topic today is going to be the, the sort of the latest rise of artificial intelligence, all in the context of Industry 4.0. We'll talk a little about the technology, uh, not too much. We don't want to get too deep into that. Um, AI, or artificial intelligence, and its history is a buzzword in the tech community. Certainly it's been a hot term on and off over the last oh, I want to say 30 years um, uh, in this area, um, and whether uh, now that AI is back, whether it's really something new, and if so, why is it something new? Why, why is it going to stick this time? Um, and finally, if it's so intelligent, can we leave, can we leave the driving to it, um, or do we need to really pay attention as we sort of go down the road, if you will? Our panelists are um, uh, Heather Ames and Max Versace, uh, co-founder of Nerala, which is a tech startup uh, based here in Boston that's, uh, I think, roughly speaking, bringing AI to the factory. There are probably some finer points you can put on it, but uh, that seems like a good start today. They were founded about, what, 14 years ago, and now, at least if I read the uh, Internet correctly, it says you've got 50 employees, but I suspect you have more at this point, but uh, a large company. Um, and they were made famous... Um, I think for a number of reasons, but uh, Max at least called out an article they did, uh, I believe, together when they were back in uh, Boston University on um, yet another attempt at, but maybe this is the real one, uh, putting a brain on a chip uh, based on little logic elements called memristors, uh, which sound like I've heard of them before, but like AI, you never know. Um, our other panelist is... Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute, is Bob Lamkin. He's a former VC, a former venture capitalist with uh, Techno Venture Management. Um, he's an early veteran of AI, so he can tell us about the history. Um, he's a sales and marketing guy, and I believe, um, Bob, that you are currently a VP at Zift Solutions, which I have to believe is based somewhere in Boston. Well, it's based in North Carolina. So. Close. That's close. It's close. It, it, it's actually based in my basement, right? So. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me step back before we dig into this. Um, I probably butchered all of your backgrounds, and this program I think is going to be on the order of um, 45 minutes, so we don't want to go too, too far in it. But uh, Heather and Max, can I get you? And, and sometimes I'll say Max and Heather. Sometimes Heather and Max will try to will try to mix it up. But do you guys, do you, the two of you want to give us a little more on your background so it doesn't seem we're being too flip? You start, because he's saying Heather and Max. 
Um, sure. Do you want just our personal backgrounds or the company? Um, mix it up. Mix it up. Okay. Um, so Max and myself and our co-founder Anatoly, we met in graduate school at Boston University. And um, that's where we got the idea for starting Nerala because we wanted to take our research and actually apply it to real world problems on uh, real world hardware solutions. Um, and so we've been doing that ever since. Um, and, and Anatoly is also still with the company. Um, Max and I are married and we have four kids together. So that has also happened during the, during the evolution um, of the company. I feel like each child was born when there was a significant shift in what was going on with the business. Um, but we're still alive and kicking. Um, we're very passionate about AI and what we're doing. Um, and even more so today where um, we feel like we've really hit a sweet spot in terms of how can we uh, use AI for good and enable people to get back to work under these circumstances, regardless of where they're at. I think it's a, an interesting anecdote on Neurala is that, uh, you know, Heather brought uh, a, a large bottle of Chianti to a meeting and then she made me drink it. And she, I thought I was signing the incorporation documents, but it was a marriage certificate. Oh, ha, ha. That's not true. I just came up with this. This That's is pretty good. No. David, what do you think? I, I am uh, I am in good shape this morning, but yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, at least it wasn't a prenup. Um, <laughs> um, okay, that's that's great. So, Bob, can you um, uh, fix the butchering I did of your background? Well, you were pretty accurate. Uh, I am supposed to be retired, but uh, retirement is not for sissies, so I decided <laughs> not to retire. Um, I did start my career many, many years ago working for Digital Equipment Corporation uh, when DEC was DEC, if you recall those days. Uh, but I had the, uh, the, the fortune of joining a company called Symbolics uh, in the early, early days of artificial intelligence when uh, people really didn't know what AI was. Uh, I, I even remember a situation where uh, I was at a conference that I had with my team and across the hall there was another uh, conference going on and it said AI and we were quite interested to see that there was another AI at the same time in the same place. So we went in to visit with them and it turns out it was artificial insemination. Uh, oh. They were talking about cows. So, <laughs> so, so, so definitely it was, it was different. But, I, but I have, that technology but, was more successful than AI. I mean, that worked. It, it was in those days. It yeah. was in those. It was a heady day. It was when, uh, when artificial intelligence was in its earliest stage. Although, as, as I realized, uh, AI is not new. It's been around for about 50 to 60 years at least the term itself. Um, but in terms of the number of in nuclear winters or AI winters that have gone through, uh, there's been a lot of changes. And, and obviously it brings us up to Nerala where they're really bringing something to market that people can actually use and understand without necessarily being a Lisp programmer. Okay, so hold on, let's step back. And by the way, um, on the screen, I think everyone's gonna be watching this. Um, uh, in the uh, Connected Things Working From Home series, they're gonna watch it on something that looks like Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams, which is where we are right now. Um, you, uh, the, the three of you are separated by uh, um, the typical video separator. Do you know each other or are you meeting for the first time? No, no, uh, I actually met with them, it's gotta be almost eight or nine years ago in the early days. I was a uh, mentor at the Boston University Entrepreneur Program out of the Equestrian School. And I was across the street one day and I learned about uh, Heather and Max. Uh, and because of my background, I thought I could help. And we had some nice conversations and I've known you since and I've been watching you very carefully since. And you, you've really, uh, you really made reality out of what was not necessarily reality in those days. And, Thank you. and that's actually interesting, David, it's, uh, you know, because Neurala had basically two stars. Like in 2006, as we say, we uh, created a, we, we created Neurala to contain a patent around using GPUs for deep learning. Uh, that was very early times. And then, uh, you know, we, there wasn't much to do in AI commercially with neural networks back then. There were processors were not fast enough. Data was not available. The algorithm were still a little iffy. So we, we kept the company uh, stealth 
uh, or as a side project. We did some projects left and right until 2013, when we actually realized that the time was ripe and all those innovation converged uh, to, to make AI finally uh, usable. And so we joined the Techstar Accelerator in uh, close to MIT, actually. So we kind of avoided at least a few years of false starts, because imagine if we would have left the university and started in 2010, the time was not ripe. And so that, you know, um, when, you, when you're dealing with AI, you have to be careful not to invest much too quickly in something that is not ripe, because your brain is just thinking it's going to work. Uh, it's a miracle technology. It takes a, lot, a long time. And even after 2013, I would say that today with the, our fourth kid, we have uh, kind of uh, gone into a, a product market fit with something that can be sold repeatedly. So, so the sort of, uh, you know, scaling up uh, that, that AI uh, is supposed to do eventually as a mature company. But before that, we did a lot of project ad hoc integration, but never reached the, 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 the point where we can resell the same thing over and over again at scale. And so we can talk details about that, but it's, it has been a painful process but the most important thing is to stay alive throughout this learning uh, curve, learning experience. Right. Right. Well, that was a great answer. Um, I was even hoping for something simpler, but that was even way better than I could have imagined. I was, I was going to simply say, don't be strangers on the on this call. You, you, the the three of you ought to talk pretty freely. And to the extent I can shut up, I should and will. Um, mm -hmm. So that said, so um, I have a crude picture of. Um, artificial intelligence now, and I, I painted it on the phone, if you will, when we uh, before this call uh, to the three of you, and I heard the snickers in the background. So I wanted you to fix that up, but a very, very high level, um, sort of a black box-ish level of at least current AI, because I don't think the details of it matter so much other than that it is a black box based, I think, in math and in logic that learns, and that learning really matters, um, and it can continue to evolve, but it is all based on learning. And once it learns something, right or wrong, it produces output consistent, one would think, with its learning. But can you do better than that without uh, torturing an audience that is probably not um, wildly uh, technically deep? Uh, nothing personal, of course. But go ahead. Any of you? Should Hello. I? Heather. Yeah. Oh, Heather. Here you go. Heather. <laughs> No, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty good um, simplification of the technology. Um, I think it's key to point out that it's adaptive um, and that um, it does learn from the data you put into it. So if you put bad data in, you will get bad data out. Um, however, a lot of the technology has evolved, especially some of the technology we've developed where um, that's not necessarily the end point of sort of uh, teaching a system and then deploying it, but rather you continue to learn through deployments. Um, so you can make small adjustments. Um, we also work on anomaly detection where you teach the system with only good examples. Let's say you're, you're, um, you have a, a, a line at a bread making factory. And so you only have examples of, you know, what does the bread look like that comes out of the line that's um, good to sell. Um, so we can catch anomalies where uh, that, that aren't measurable anomalies, but something sort of like, oh, the bread is too puffy. The bread is, is too dark. The bread... Um, isn't fully filled in the pan and so forth. Those are things that the system can say, this looks a little bit different, let's take another look at it. Um, and then the last thing I would say about it is, um, it is a learning technology, which means it has a lot of power and it is not an autonomous technology at all. It is um, a technological tool that a person can use to do their job better. So why without, and, and now I, and I, I, I just want to dip my toe in, uh, to the technology even deeper. So that was clearly a black box approach. What was it? And then I want to get I want to get over to Bob to, for him to discuss. And this is what I want you to set up, Bob. By the way, um, just dipping your toe in. What does the technology look like when you open the box up? Um, is it based on memristors, your your new logic elements? And I don't think it is. But what is it based on, and what was new about it? Again, at a very high level. Because then we're going to ask Bob what it was like in the Stone Age of AI. <laughs> well, um, so, so, actually, can you hear me that? I can make an example. Oh, yep. <laughs> so Heather drinks. Show and tell. Us, despite she's married to an Italian that doesn't mean espresso, but anyway. Uh, so, so imagine that uh, you want to teach uh, sort of a, 
uh, it, I call it GoFi or people call it GoFi or good old fashioned AI, it's an acronym. Uh, what this is, or you want to teach a neural network or this deep learning new wave technology that is actually 40 years old, but it's being rebranded new deep learning. Um, and so in, in the traditional machine vision, you will basically create, the, the, the researcher will spend time to analyze the problem, analytically create a detector for this, which is can go something like, okay, the, if the object is uh, roughly cylindrical, has something sticking out that is orangish, has any of these letter in here, then, then I create the classifier on top of this feature extraction, um, um, you know, machine vision process to then say, okay, it's a, probably a Dunkin' Donuts versus you know a Starbucks or something else. So that's a traditional uh, artificial intelligence that has been around for many many decades, which you know works uh, in many many conditions, has fueled, uh, for instance, machine vision and manufacturing for for ages. Um, to do what is capable to do today, right? So let's call it 1.0 uh, of uh, um, you know machine vision and industrial automation. But uh, artificial intelligence comes from a completely different background when it when it's about neural networks. So in this case, all the intelligence of the researchers like myself and Heather was not to build ad hoc feature structure for this particular object, but to build equations that will extract features autonomously mimicking how the human brain does that uh, seamlessly on a daily basis when you look, look around your environment. And so all our effort was to create those learning equations that can extract features by themselves and learn autonomously when I present you something, this is something else, right? And then you, you can map that into, you know, a Dunkin' Donuts label or whatever you want. And mm, so well, it's a ahead. shift of the intelligence between creating features that are very intelligent for you know, built by you know traditional uh, artificial intelligence versus uh, shifting your your brain power to create this learning equation, which are you know equally if not more complicated, but they are more general in the sense that can be taught anything, not just the Dunkin' Donuts, but also you know other objects. So now, let me let me ask this um, before we turn over to Bob. Um, if we looked at um, artificial intelligence and neural networks as a black box and, and discussed it um, with, with both uh, your Max and Heather's answers, if we looked at it um, sort of functionally, uh, and you dug into that even further, Max, if I could open that black box I assume, and I could identify a bunch of repeatable other black boxes inside of it, little AI ants, so to speak, what would each one of those ants be doing? Because I have a feeling there is an answer there. There, you say they're all specialized equations, but are there autonomous things at one level below the big black box, which is a convenient way to think of how these things learn and act? What would that be, Heather, Max, even Bob? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll keep uh, I'll keep <laughs> the train of thought. So, um, the fundamental building blocks of uh, neural networks are neurons. Uh, and uh, synapses, mimicking sort of like what, what people human find brain. people's brain. If I open Heather's brain, I find billions of these neurons and, and synapses and trillions of synapses. So the, the knowledge, the, where, where the, 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 the juice of the intelligence in the neural networks are, is in the synapses, is in the connection between neurons. And so there are multiple ways in which you can uh, visualize what the AI is thinking uh, or is learning throughout the process. And so uh, there is actually a field called explainable AI that is looking on, you know, making this knowledge available to uh, customers or researchers to understand what the what the black box is thinking. Um, so for instance, you know, if you're uh, using one of the product of Neurala, the next iteration, and I, I don't know if I should announce it before. Uh, it, it, you heard it here first. Yeah, <clears throat> so it will have a layer of explainability to understand, as Heather was mentioning, the the loaf of bread, what's you know that, that that are you know you can show normal bread, and then at a certain point, a piece of bread comes out that is all you know screwed up. So our uh, AI will highlight the part of the image where these synapses that have been trained on normal bread are malfunctioning or are saying something that is out of the ordinary. And can so you can you step back? Just is there an easy way to say it's made up of neurons? Um, with synapses in each neuron's job. Again, I'm trying to develop a simple mental picture so we can move off the technology. 
Yep. Each neuron's job is to, I don't know what an ant's job is, but ants must have jobs, find food and bring it back home. Each neuron here, its job, does it have a special job or does it, is each neuron get a different sort of equation and memory set to use each time? No, so each, so each neuron is created identical. The thing that changes to the neurons is the data. Uh, and so it, as, a, as the human brain, for instance, you have a layer of neurons uh, on your eye starting, uh, you know, a few centimeters behind your, your, you know, your face. That's the first layer of uh, thousands of layers that you have in your brain that goes from the sensory data all the way to the neurons that control, you know, your fingers. And so uh, each neuron though obeys very similar law and very similar rules. What changes is that what what data is consumed. Your eye consumes photon, but then your your neurons up here consume uh, very elaborate information that has already been processed by your brain. So meaning consume you know neurons up here think about world peace and uh, and uh, exploration of Mars, whereas neurons in in your eye think about pixels. Let me just clarify. Um, so the, the neurons really differentiate based on layer or functional layers where taking that analogy, the neurons that are in your eye are, are, are just transforming the input in some way to make the features um, more salient to the system. Whereas other neurons further down the weights on them are being modified with that input data to hold that information in place. Don't uh, have a specific function though in my brain. I thought the ones that are doing peace and world peace and and or global climate change. I thought they were kind of stuck. You know, they're kind of stuck doing that. Well, uh, some people are missing those neurons completely. <laughs> well, I know, but that we're not. Well, this is not a political one. But yes, I agree. They live in Washington now in a White House. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I think that that's like important to note. Um, you know, particularly with humans who have degradation of memory over time and so forth. In uh, machine learning, we call that catastrophic forgetting, um, if you will. And um, it's really important to be able to build systems that as it encounters new information or new knowledge, it doesn't lose the knowledge it previously had. Um, so you don't wanna have a quick complete wipeout. Um, so that's another thing that happens with those weights is that they, they, they change slowly over time as they encounter new knowledge, either um, slowly eroding, eroding past irrelevant knowledge or creating stronger memories for those things that they continue to encounter or creating new memories for things they encounter in life. So is that enough for Bob to tell us about, and you guys can help along, but is that enough for Bob to tell us about what the old AI was? I, I think I can. You know, I think what, what actually what Heather and Max have been doing is something that Marvin Minsky and the rest of the uh, early pioneers were hoping could be done. Uh, they, th that the problem we had 40, 50 years ago is that the technology wasn't there to actually accomplish what it was that they were trying to do. And, and so much of what happened in the early days was a result of overselling and underproducing. Uh, and, and as the VP of sales at Symbolics, I can tell you, we oversold a lot. Uh, and, and, and the bottom line is that the original theory behind all of this, which was started 50, 60, 70 years ago, was really about mimicking the brain. The, the idea in those days was someday we're going to be able to replace the brain with, with all the neurons and all the synapses. Everything that you could be done is going to be done by a computer. And that scared the hell out of a lot of people in those days. And uh, nevertheless, the challenge that everybody had back in the 70s and 80s was the ideas were there, the technology wasn't. Uh, there was a group of people within MIT who had some funding from the government. Uh, the, the initial funding for artificial intelligence did not come from some commercial application that I thought it would be saving you know, people money or creating jobs for people. It had to do with Star Wars. It had to do with how, what are we gonna do about the Russians and how are we gonna detect whether or not they're launching missiles at us. And DARPA and several of the other agencies said, we're gonna fund this. And a, and a tremendous amount of money, at least in today's, uh, in today's numbers, was funded at MIT. And the folks at MIT began building this basis for artificial intelligence. They create. They realized that the existing computers that, that were in place 
we're not capable of doing this. So they created uh, a language um, that uh, up until very recently, I think at MIT was, was uh, Computer Science 101 was LISP. Um, euphemistically known as lots of silly parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really all about making it, uh, giving a, a language that a computer could actually use to execute these capabilities. Uh, and a machine was built at MIT, um, and that machine ultimately was licensed to companies like Symbolics to, to actually build a commercial application, a commercial solution. And that was in the early 80s. And there were a couple of companies that were in that space. There was a lot of competition inside, but there was a lot of, uh, how can I put it, um, philosophical decisions as to whether or not you should even commercialize this. This should be made available for everyone in the world, and you should never, ever create a company out of it. There was a lot of uh, internal problems um, with people like Richard Greenblatt, who, Blatt, who said, you can't do this. Th th this can't be sold. It has to be made available to everybody. Was the fundamental, um, so looking at Lisp, the language, did it fundamentally run in the same manner that Max and Heather's um, the machines they're operating run on now, that is, was is it the same neural network, but the hardware needed to evolve and the Lisp machine didn't do it? Or was it a fundamentally different technology? Well, I, I think what Max and, and Heather can certainly talk about this, it, it, it's quite different. Um, at, at the time, I think what the goals were were, were quite different as well. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, they built this Lisp machine to run Lisp. It was a dedicated machine to, dedic to, to run this one application or this one, this one language. Uh, the challenge, of course, is <laughs> there weren't very many people who could program in Lisp. So th there was already an inherent uh, buffer in terms of how big the market could grow because there weren't enough uh, software developers. I can remember, actually, in the 80s, if you went to MIT and you had a Lisp background, this is in the 80s, you could start as a Lisp programmer at eighty dollars to $100,000 a year in 1980 because there were so few of them. Uh, that, of course, constrained the situation. But, but in the end, the problem was there was no real commercialization. Uh, I can tell you we sold 7,000 Lisp machines. That was a lot of list machines. The original, the original plan was to sell about 50. So, so everybody and their brother wanted one, but nobody knew exactly what the hell to do with them. And, and so just to help us move off the technology and to get into more of the um, business side of this, um, Heather and Max, is the, was that old technology the same as the new technology? It just turns out that it's better implemented now at a hardware level, or was it just fundamentally not the wrong, but a different technology. I think it's, just, I don't know about fundamentally because there's, you know, some building blocks from right. then, but it is definitely a different technology today, um, both in the hardware architectures um, as well as in the algorithms that have been developed. So I, I remember I took my first uh, AI class taking Lisp and mm -hmm. there was a lot of logic. It was a lot of fun. It was yeah. a lot of logic. But um, at the same time, I was also taking my first neuroscience class, which was studying the, the, what I, later I call the Bible of neuroscience, which is Candace Warston's just uh, principles of neuroscience, which was um, essentially a very, there is no AI into that. It's just learning very detailed what the brain does. A thick book and uh, the, the, the professor was ferocious and evil. Um, and like uh, they all are. Well, once, once I took an exam and there was one of the three guys out of a hundred who didn't get, I got like a pass, like a minimum, the rest, they had to do it again. Uh, so, but um, then th that's how I got the passion into AI uh, because I was studying simultaneously Lisp, which was fantastic. It was a you know a great mental exercise, but had very little to do with the brain uh, in in the sense of uh, you know understanding how that machinery produces thoughts that then can be implemented, say you know with high level languages like like Lisp. Uh, and the AI that you know has resulted uh, out of this with hardware and software is radically different than than whatever you produced in Lisp. For instance, the, Nerala has put 
tens of millions of uh, uh, visual AI algorithm into uh, a top three cell phone manufacturer that actually uses a neuromorphic chip, which is ne nothing to do with the symbolic chip that uh, Bob was talking about, but has much to do with uh, the DARPA Synapse project that we talked that you talked about that that this is looking to mimic uh, you know neurons and synapses in hardware. So that kind of AI is coming to fruition. In the is hardware. there somebody in addition to your work at uh, BU? Is there um, and I'm half smiling when I say that, but is there somebody? who can be, or a group that can be credited with having uh, sort of like the Steve Jobs or the Albert Einstein, I don't know, name, name a name, of um, computing who can be credited with the transformation from the old days uh, at Symbolics to what you guys are doing now? There are many. I mean, Heather mentioned Grossberg, which is, was uh, our thesis advisor, uh, Steve Grossberg, who actually was, uh, you know, went from MIT to BU because MIT was not really a, a, the place to pursue neural networks back in the 80s. Uh, they, there was a, you know, this, a symbolic AI movement that was against neural networks. And that's actually why MIT has missed out on the revolution in deep learning, because they, they just didn't like it. Thank uh, you, well, they, they, they basically said, we're MIT and you're not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that was the attitude. So the two co-founders uh, of uh, our department, Steve Grossberg and Gail Carpenter, left you know, MIT where they were and they founded Boston University under John Silbert, which was you know, a strong figure that fostered you know, this sort of- uh, Radical thinking. Radical yeah. thinking, yeah. Uh, yeah. But then other people that come to mind are Carver Mead out of California, that was a pioneer in neuromorphic computing. Some of the people that we know, uh, Kavabuena Boind and uh, uh, Ralph Etienne Cummings at-, at uh, uh, Entering. Sure. Andrew Ng, Andrew, Andrew Ng, but um, um, Karl Lanz Meyer in Germany. So th these are all uh, pioneer in neuromorphic computing. I even my our uh, uh, DARPA manager Todd Hilton, which uh, uh, now is I think is, uh, is in uh, UC Irvine, who spearheaded the DARPA Synapse project, out of which many uh, companies actually fe fell out and ideas fell out to uh, to, to foster this neuromorphic computing uh, wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that makes sense. So um, slightly changing gears, AI has since, uh, oh, I started practicing in the mid 80s, AI has popped up, I want to say three times, at least twice, but I think it's popped up three times as the buzzword that you needed that a, that a uh, software or potentially hardware, but a computer company needed to use to ensure that it would get funding. Mm -hmm. um, and it never seemed to go much further than that. Um, but can, I don't know who this question goes to, but was I, am, is that too uh, jaded a view of what AI was and hopefully is not still? Well, I think I, I, also just real quick a comment and then Bob, um, I'll hand it over to you. No problem. Um, should also not forget the parts where in between those mm -hmm. um, were the dips where uh, when Max and I initially started writing grants for the work that we were doing, we weren't allowed to use the word AI. I those you, applications. You, take, you remember, I find you if you take the word AI out of it. Yeah, okay. so there's, it's an up and a down, but go ahead, Bob. No, what I was going to say is, you know, being in venture capital for a long time too, there is always this excitement that somebody comes up with something new and the next thing you know, you have 25 venture capital companies funding 25 different companies. Uh, and and it, the excitement was there, but in, in the end, you really had to deliver something. I, I wanted to go back to something in terms of what Symbolics did. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, they had was technology. And the demise of, of uh, Symbolics actually came as a result of the 386 chip. Uh, that what you what you could do with brute force, uh, with you know, you know, dozens and dozens of uh, 386 chips all connected together, uh, was something you could do a lot cheaper and a lot faster than you could do on a Lisp machine. But what they did do is they created some interesting software, uh, and a, a lot of the, um, the the films that are going on now, the the, the um, uh, Finding Nemo and all of those were begun years and years ago by Symbolics uh, and this object-oriented programming that Howard Cannon had uh, invented. And they did bird flocks and you could, it, it was amazing. The, the birds had, it, had some intelligence. You could see things going on and the birds would just go and fly around. Uh, and it was all part of this notion that this, this 
is more than just a you know a, a Fortran or a COBOL. This was something that could do some really exciting things. Um, one of the things that led to uh, again the problem that Symbolics had in the AI is the commercial applications. As you said, it it, it was all pretty much government and all the stuff that was going on in and NSA and CIA and so on. There was one flicker of hope that came around uh, by a, a company called Inference that did expert systems. And the first commercial application that actually could be proved to save money and save time was with American Express. And, and American Express um, created something called the expert, uh, expert assistant or the authorizes assistant, where if you put a credit card in, since American Express had no credit limits, it was a lot different than a Visa card or a MasterCard. So what, what happened was you put your card in and somehow or another, it notices that this purchase is in Italy and you live in Chicago. Hmm, this doesn't sound right. So they, in, they interviewed a, dozens and dozens of authorizers and came up with scenarios as to what could happen. So it could know, okay, we also found out that, yes, it was in Italy, but he also had uh, purchased a ticket to fly to Italy. So therefore, that is most likely going to be uh, okay. Um, on the other hand, if they didn't see any of that, it would be rejected. Uh, and that saved an enormous amount of money. And what was happening is the processing went initially through an IBM mainframe, and it kicked out these anomalies, which then went through Symbolics list machines, running this expert system and creating this solution. We sold dozens and dozens of uh, uh, 360s, list machines, to American Express for that express that sole purpose. Okay, so that was not the answer I was looking for. I was looking for you to say good observation. It was largely BS every time it came up before, <laughs> but this time it doesn't sound like it really is BS. Well, you know what do they say? One swallow does not make a summer. Uh, you know, it, it, we we weren't able to actually replicate that in any creative way. Because the problems were that in order to do this, you had to be an American Express with deep pockets in order to do these kinds of things. Then, then of course, you know, companies like Sun and other workstations came out. Uh, the, 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 uh, the hubris of the founders uh, of the company, who were MITers, basically said, they can't do it. We're better than they are, and there's no need to do anything differently. Well, we found out that there was a lot of ways to do it differently, and unfortunately, the company failed. Okay, so let's jump forward. Let's jump forward um, to today, modern day, sort of 20, so it sounds like 2010 on, right, ish. And so now there is something that makes this instantiation of AI the one that's going to survive more than the next investment cycle. Um, Nerala is an example of that, but there are a lot of other companies. Why is AI, we know technologically it's different. Um, we've talked about that already. But there's, and Bob alluded to um, uh, another driving force or at least another enabler, um, unlike certain enablers that we hear about in Washington, D.C. But um, the enabler here is the fact there are programmers out there now who you had to know Lisp before and not many did, but now you don't, I don't think. So what is it, Max and Heather, that is has making AI real and will give it traction this time? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is that it's, it's still not all real. Um, <laughs> You're not supposed to say it's, that. It's, it's real. <laughs> um, real we were raising money in 2016, early 2016. People would shut the door in our faces. End of 2016, they didn't even know what, want to know what we were doing um, because everybody wanted it. So, um, there's a lot of noise. We were the only ones talking about AI. Then it became a point where um, as loud as we could scream, nobody could hear us above the noise. Um, but now we're starting to see that kind of thin out a bit more. And what we're starting to see is um, some efforts to build actual real applications and not just one, but many of them through various companies um, and various use cases. So um that's been a, a kind of a shift even in the lifetime uh, that Max and I have been involved in AI. Are you well, suggesting, before you go on, are you suggesting there's a disconnect, and there may be, 
between the current um, uh, what what was uh, Greenspan's term the 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 hype the the bubble is there a, is there a um, is there a disconnect between the fluff that occurs the, at the investor at the investor level and what's going on at the real doable level at the, uh, for you folks like you? I think there's absolutely still hype. And over the last several years, one of the most important things for Norala to do is to train a sales organization that can tease away the people that were wasting our time because their boss said we need AI or they wanted to learn more about it with those that actually knew how it could benefit their business. You know what's right. amazing? Th this is like deja vu all over again. I bet. <laughs> Running the sales organization in the 80s was exactly the same as what you're doing now, telling the sales guys, hey, listen, you got to find somebody who actually is going to use this stuff. We sold uh -huh. we sold a machine to everybody's uncle, brother, sister, aunt. I mean, all of the people we sold them to, nobody had any idea what they were going to do with them other than you know the secret agencies that you couldn't do anything about. What I find thrilling about what Nerala is doing is that that it's saying you don't have to be an AI expert to do this. You know, AI is just another technology. What you've done now is created a, 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 a solution that every man can use. You, you really have, the only thing you need to know is what your problem is. Yeah. That's so what's what, 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 the issue? Is the, was the issue for both, I mean, maybe it's a dumb question, but you'd think you'd be thrilled to oversell this. Um, no. But is the issue that you, that the companies that don't really need it, when it comes time to sign on the dotted line and to send you the check, it falls through? Or are you worried? No, no, they'll they'll end up buying it. They'll be a little unhappy, but we'll we'll bank it and move on. What's the issue? Not to be dumb we're, about we're it. We're trying to build a, a great company. Um, so selling um, our solution to anybody just that just thinks AI is cool doesn't help us get there. We want to work with our customers to develop the technology and make it better. Um, it also wastes a ton of resources and time just in terms of troubleshooting and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it wastes resources on, on the compute, you know, cloud computing infrastructure. So um, for us, it's really key for us to find um, people that we can scale our business with um, at this point in time rather than just to sell stuff. So at the end of the day, I think uh, the most important question, and that's why you know AI has come to fruition in so many applications, is does it work? And what? if it works, you know, does it work to the level where it matters? And then, and then is it solving a, a problem that the customer is willing to pay for, right? And so, for instance, in one of our uh, most successful application in uh, you know cell phones. We were running on cell phones. Every time the, the person was taking a picture, we were uh, analyzing each pixel in the image and you know segmenting object of interest. And at the end of the day, we were making the picture better. So that mattered for the uh, smartphone manufacturer because all the smartphones are pretty similar. How can they gain their upper hand? By putting AI on the chip mm -hmm. that every time you take a picture makes the picture look better. So what does this, that result into? Well. The consumer reports are going to show that that particular brand of cell phone has the best picture in the market. And so that's why we were very successful into doing that. And then we have replicated this a few other ways. But the, the key is that AI has to be precise enough to be reliable and do something useful for the end customer. And the end customer actually has to have a reason to have it other than just enjoyment of the C-level people that when they play golf each other, they say, I have AI, what about you? I mean, I think yeah. it's, it's it's the same old, same old, which is that you don't want to build a company off of a technology looking for a problem. A company is successful if it solves people's problems. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, as I say, it's deja vu because we had the same situation, you know, 40 years ago. Um, but th this is sales 101 as well. I mean, in the end, nobody buys something. I mean, some people will buy it because it's cool, but most people won't buy another one unless it actually solves the problem. Exactly, and they won't renew their subscriptions, and then we have a it, issue. It's just that's yeah. exactly right. So I mean, so so what I think Nerala is doing, and several other AI companies are beginning to do, is realize that you better solve a serious problem. Uh, the the problem we had with expert systems and the authorizers assisted wasn't that it didn't solve a problem. It saved millions of dollars. Yeah. It literally saved millions of dollars in fraud because they were able to detect when there was really fraud. 
And the, 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 that was the good news. The bad news is they weren't able to replicate it and the cost of it was, was so high. Well, now that barrier is gone. The, yeah. the, the, the my, my iPhone has more power than like all the list machines in the world. So <laughs> it, 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 it clearly is more about doing that. And it's more about companies like Neurala uh, who basically say, you know what? I'm not going to play the hype game. Because if I do, it's going to come crashing down on us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it, the earlier AI winters all came as a result of over, uh, over uh, anticipating what this could do and under delivering. So can we address that, the winters? Because I think that's my perspective, um, from sort of the law side, so as a vendor to companies like yours. Um, it's I've seen the the springs and the winters, I guess those are, or maybe it's the summers and the winters, which, but if we apply a high pass filter and sort of remove all the, um, I keep coming back to the uh, Greenspan, the exuberance, um, if we get rid of all the fluff that the investors put in and that the uh, ill-informed companies put in, so we get, apply a high pass filter and look at this technology, this AI technology, has it actually been and on a fairly steady growth curve since 19, 1980, and it's just better now because, of course, the on the software side or the logic side, it's improved, and the hardware base is much better. It's faster, and there are programmers to do it. So it's just the natural growth of an industry or a technology which should eventually be there. Is that all we're seeing? We ignore, ignore, ignore the hype? Absolutely. It's, it's definitely evolving in the right direction. Um, and just on on the the point of programmers that can program it um we we have some presentations where we talk about like the number of phds in in the world that can actually build these systems it's very few um but you don't need to build rebuild a system every time you want to build tech you know or rebuild the technology every time you want to build a system that makes use of ai and so as bob pointed out that's something we've really been focusing hard on is how can we um enable um, this technology for more people to use. Um, AI but, for everybody. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to make it just for this elite. I mean, it keeps us employed for the rest of our lives for sure, but um, that's not really the point. And, um, you know, another piece of that is really about, um, I like to speak about diversity, which is that if you build technology that's siloed for only certain people that have had specific opportunities to learn how to use it and develop it, that's all you're going to get out of it. Um, that's not going to be a very good technology. But if you build a technology that people can use um, across different education levels and societies and so forth, and they can add to that and they can build things that enable um, their products to provide better solutions for their customers, then we're really doing our job because we're making this available. So what I think I was going to say that there are still there are still applications that are incredibly important. Uh, I suspect, although I don't know for sure, all this research that's going on for vaccines and treatments for uh, COVID uh, are extensively using artificial intelligence to speed up the process to do this. Yeah. Um, I, I was also thinking about that one of the problems we had is that, and my wife is a psychotherapist, and she used to take notes and so on, and that you'd have all these notes and you'd make some judgments based upon these notes. A lot of doctors and psycho psycho psychologists said, you know what, I'm not going to let some computer decide what's going on. You know, the, the issue of trusting the, the, the output of artificial intelligence is another important thing that, that, that in the end, I, I think, especially in the early days, there was a lot of skepticism and a lot of anxiety. They, they remembered, you know, 2001, a space odyssey when Hal took over the, uh, took over the spacecraft. And there was a lot of anxiety about that. I think people are becoming more comfortable with it, especially when AI is really not, it's not artificial and it's not intelligence. Yeah. It's, it's just another technology. It also comes from people being able to harness their own data and put it into the system themselves. So right. if you take the example um, from psychotherapy, um, I doubt many of those doctors would be comfortable with saying, hey, we've got this database of you know, doctors across the world that have made similar um, diagnoses, and we're just going to aggregate all that information and pump it out. Well, the diagnosis in that situation is very subjective. Um, and my bet is these, these uh, doctors will be much more comfortable saying, okay, I've got this base system, but I can add my own knowledge. 
my own perspectives and my own opinions in this, and then I can stand up behind it and put my name on it because yeah. I know that ultimately I'll make the decision. Yes. It's helping me make it's my decision. Make decision. It's right. not telling me how to do my job. Can so. we go back and um, before we dive into that, I, one question, Heather, you suggested, and um, so you don't. Not everyone needs to design these systems. Not everyone needs to design. They're not three eighty six processes anymore either. But nobody, not everyone needs to be able to design a processor to use it. Um, so it makes sense that not a lot of people can design AI systems. But what level of person is now necessary um, at your, uh, say, Neurala's uh, customers um, to generate a useful application? Is it somebody with a high school degree? Is it necessarily still a programmer? Is it only somebody who knows, used to know Lisp or their modern day equivalent? What level do you sell to? So with respect to our customers, um, what we're aiming for is um, individuals that have their own um, job expertise necessary to perform their job yeah. to bring this tool in. So when we're speaking about in a manufacturing floor, I think we'll have a bit of a variety there. They have to have some familiarity with technology, um, but um, we want to make it that you do not have to have an advanced mathematical degree. You need to understand your problem you're trying to solve, and this is a tool that you can use to do that. But is it but programmatic? Do you, do you write code? Sorry, do you write code, or what do you do to implement it? You don't need to write code to implement it. You need to be able to click on an interface that is uh, easier to use than uh, Photoshop. And just say this is a good product, this is a bad product, and then everything under the hood is AI. But they don't are they are never exposed to AI uh, or to tweak anything. So it's completely you know transparent to them what they're doing. Okay, so that le okay, so let me ask something because that leads to my the sort of the, the next and final uh, sequence of this, which is you need to train these models, and that's, that's the training part you're talking about. But you also need to define what they're being trained on. I'm assuming that you couldn't can't simply say. You can't simply buy your machine, say a Neurala machine or anyone else's machines. There are other companies out there. You can't buy an AI machine, take it out of the box, turn it on, and show it a picture of a piece of bread and say, good or bad. Don't you have to say, look at this characteristic, look at color? Don't you have to, you don't have to no. identify the, the variables to focus on? Not yeah. anymore. Oh. Yeah. yeah, which is great because that's what my PhD was based on, was feature <laughs> extraction. Now it's obsolete. So, um, but no, that's. <laughs> That's one of the amazing new changes in the technology is that they learn what features are most important. So you present it with the bread and you tell it if it's good or bad, um, or just that this is good bread. Um, and when something changes or is different, it's going to say, hey, this is, this doesn't look good anymore. You want to check it out? So all you do is, is be sure that you're feeding the right thing, mm -hmm. right? That you're feeding bread that is good and just say, this is good bread. You're not feeding like bread that is not good, telling the machine this is good bread. Then well, the that's a different issue. And could the very same machine that you turn on and show pictures of the bread, you could instead hook it up to a microphone and have it listen to birds and have it say, this is a good parrot and this is a bad parrot or whatever the parrot bird would happen to be. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, so what happens? I thought there was a huge, um, my, my misconception was there was a lot of bias, now going to sort of the evil side of AI or at least the imperfect side. A lot of bias was introduced by models that were not so much trained wrong, but had the wrong basis upon which to do the training at all, i.e. they focused on the wrong data, not data sets, but variables. Was that not long, no longer a form of bias? I mean, that still happens, um, sure. Um, we have some optimization functions within our system that allow you to, um, it happens in the background, sorts through different architectures to find the one that's most useful for, for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, we do that all automatically rather than having to have the knowledge on how to do that. So, but that, that doesn't mean that if, um, if a person who let's say loved cardinals only played um, cardinal bird songs into the system to define a bird song and then it plays like a crow or something that says, not a bird, um, you know, you get those biases from the operator, but from the architectures, we've added a lot of flexibility so that those can be optimized for the use cases. So where do, do the biases then largely come from? So what is that? What's that common? That user error? That is bad training? That's so it's really the data sets. Well, correct? I mean, the, the problem is that we we humans have watched too many movies of Hollywood uh, where the robots are super intelligent and they do like C-3PO, the Star Wars, they have full-fledged conversation in 25 languages and they play jokes. 
the, the, the reality is that we are still at the stone age of AI. And so if you don't understand that you're dealing with a kid that, uh, with an empty brain and whatever you're, you're stuffing into the empty brain is the thing that the, the AI knows uh, without any further intelligence. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't have its own judgment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know how to cook pasta and make express. So it just knows what you're teaching it. And, uh, you know, if, fortunately, in the AI that we are selling, uh, the problem is solved. Right, so imagine you're a machine, uh, you're, you're a machine operator, and you have our AI that does quality control. I would be amazed that the machine maybe it would be a patient of Bob's wife that the machine operator starts to talk to the to AI and try to teach you know the cardinal songs. All they have to do is to, you know, they're they are doing building bottles, uh, they're, or they're you know doing uh, Barbie dolls. All they need to say this is a good Barbie and this is a bad Barbie, and that's it. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, that as much as you need to know about your training data. Uh, it's something that can be easily uh, trained to somebody with a high school diploma that knows how to operate a machine. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you, you reduce the, 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 you know, the potential problems. And this AI is not going to take over the world and kill us all either, right? So it's very limited use. The other thing I would say is that if you have one of these operators on the, on the factory floor and they completely, you know, for some reason, you give them access to be able to add this learning on, just pull their issue on workflows, but and they build something that's horrible, um, and the brain is making really bad decisions. Uh, our software doesn't make you send it back to us for us to reconfigure this with our experts. You can simply just throw it away and start over with very little cost to your organization. Um, you know, we've done some, you know, costing where it can be tens of thousands of dollars to get um, AI consulting companies in to build you a brain to do that very thing. Now we're saying, hey, you messed it up, just throw it out, let's start over. Uh, I think that's really the, the key. The, the, the fundamental change between 40 years ago and now is, uh, first of all, it's accessible to just about anybody. There's no financial no major financial problem in actually getting into this program. And the other thing that, that we had as a, another problem in the 80s is that it, it's the data. We, we had the algorithms, but the, the cost of storing data mm -hmm. 40 or 50 years ago was astronomical. So we really couldn't do, couldn't solve really, really you know, creative uh, problem or large problems because we didn't have the capability of storing all that data or people who needed it couldn't afford the kind of uh, storage systems that were necessary. And that's a great point. I mean, we, just for quality assurance in manufacturing, you know, before we introduced our product, you had to spend tens of thousands. Now it's in the low digit thousands. And that, you know, five years from now, it will be hundreds of dollars. Right. To right. put uh, in, uh, human eye level inspection in the, into, you know, into machines per eye. Right. You know, so that's that's remarkable. And you know, we get to the point in which the cost would be like twenty dollars, you know, maybe in right. ten years from now. Well then you have to figure out how to make money because you have to sell a lot of them to do that at twenty dollars a piece. So well, getting this getting bring this towards a close, um, so uh, sort of artificial intelligence is it really? I think what I'm hearing you say is the systems are and it changes my view of it, AI has always been here and it continues. It started in the 80s, it continues to grow. Um, if you ignore all the hype and the winters and the springs and the summers, it's continued to grow as a technology. The prices are down. You no longer, largely no longer need programmers. You need to train this stuff. But the other thing is it still doesn't solve all your problems. It solves a sp may help you solve a specific problem. For example, identifying whether bread is good or bad or whether the sensors in your plant, I suppose, are operating out uh, abnormally out of range because the individual ones. So it sounds like you still need to put it on a specific task. You can't sort of fire it up and go to sleep at the wheel like that guy in his Tesla did many years ago uh, before it ran into the big white truck or the big white sign or whatever it was. Exactly. You know, think of it as a tool. Can't use a hammer to screw to screw in a screw, right? Right. Oh, yeah. It has a use. It's a yeah. tool to help you do your job better. Yeah, I mean, these are all special purpose AI that are extremely useful. And then there is the whole jazz about general intelligence and uh, its danger, you know, general AI and, the, you know, the ability to, you know, have a, a, something that can evolve itself and take over the world. These are like all great uh, discussion and themes. We are, we are fairly far from that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
though though it's you know it's hard to it's hard to plan for a future where the technology is still not yet available it's easier to forbid something while after it has been born and applied uh, but you know there is, there is obviously a big discussion on general AI and its danger and so forth. Uh, this is now what we are building in Norala. We are building limited uh, AI that is extremely extremely useful. And the, you know the we talked about COVID nineteen and uh, you know imagine that you have this scenario. Uh, that you you have to go to to two hospital. You have to choose two hospital to go to. One is powered by AI and uh, a superhuman AI that is able to diagnose you in one tenth of the time, one twentieth of the cost and give you like, a, you know, a basically 99.9% .9 accuracy and the other hospital is all manned by human. You have to wait four hours in the emergency room. The human might be sick and, uh, you know, and, and you get 70% accuracy. Which one would you go uh, to? It's a tough one. I mean, I still like the old-fashioned approach because if you if you manage to get the human interested in your problem, you have I a better say shot. It's only AI. It's AI augmented. Right. Oh, augmented. I think that, that that's really the key because nowadays, uh, in the early days, there was a lot of anxiety, truly, about you know AI taking over the world and it's going to be dangerous for everybody. But now people are realizing that it's. It, I hate to say it's just another technology and it's going to help people make decisions. Uh, but ultimately, the decision that's going to be made is going to be made by a human. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like the hospital uh, scenario, uh, let me give you another one. A friend of mine just bought a Tesla Model 3 and he had me test it. Right. And then at a certain point, he pressed the button and say, OK, this is a, now it goes into autopilot. So first of all, he didn't know how to use it well, so he didn't actually engage the autopilot. So thankfully, I'm a good driver, and you know, I'm from Italy, and I took it over before yeah. smashing this beautiful car into a tree that was hurt. Uh, but here's another question for you, and which is actually dives into uh, Elon Musk, uh, uh, you know, crusade against against AI. Which which car would you like to use with autonomous mode? One with you know crappy AI, and one with the best, most intelligent AI? <laughs> That's easy, isn't it? It's right. an easy, easy solution. Yeah. And so you know, you can't you can't both be a crusader against AI like Elon Musk and then uh, sell cars that actually use that technology. And the better the technology is, the safer you are. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we need to be careful and uh, turn on our brain before we talk about AI and you know think about it in a well-rounded way. You know, and uh, you know without without being uh, you know AI terrorists. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Thinking about it as a tool, so you know, if, if you think of the safety issue, if you have an, uh, an engineer building your house and they're only using paper and pencil to do all the mathematical calculations, but they have a, a, ca a calculator sitting right there and they just don't trust what comes out of it. I think it's sort of a similar thing. It's it's just a tool to help you make a better decision. I don't trust those calculators. <laughs> hey, listen, yeah. I, I started out with a slide rule and I could only use the C and D scales. I had no idea what the rest of it was. So I use the slide rule. Okay, so Heather Ames, Max Versace, and Bob Lamkin, um, many thanks. This was great. Um, uh, we'll get this posted uh, with a few other programs, and I think folks should love this. And thanks for your time. Thank you. This was a lot of Thank fun. Thank you. And great to see you, folks. <laughs> you Take too. care. Stay <laughs> safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Dave. That was a, a great program. Uh, you're a fantastic moderator. Um, <laughs> you are no, generous, Mark. No, well, actually, it brings up an important point that I think um, uh, our, our viewers and listeners would, would enjoy. You've got an interesting background. I mean, you were, again, one of the people responsible for bringing me into the Enterprise Forum many years ago, where I started off as a panelist and then began moderating some panels. And ultimately, yes, and we can make all the jokes you want around yes. my uh, participation on the board, but the Enterprise Forum has been a very important part of my life. But You've got an interesting background. I think that that informs how you're able to do this. Why don't you yeah, yeah. spend a minute or two talking about that? Right, because there may be folks out there, Mark, who are interested in joining the forum. That's and, right. In helping set up programs like just the one like we this just one. did. Right. No, and I, it's been great for me. It's been great for you. I don't know that Koch is ever going to forgive me for uh, get, introducing you and uh, helping get you on where you are today on the board. Yes. But no. So my background is I'm a I'm an IP lawyer, patent lawyer. 
I work in Boston. I'm at a great firm, Davis, Malm, D'Agostine. We're actually one of the sponsors. Right. Um, right. And I've been Thank actually you. with the MIT Enterprise Forum now for... Like 20 years, right? Oh, yeah. I think that I started back with the, uh, they were called the Special Interest Groups, probably back in 2000. Right. And um, I met quite a few people through the forum. Um, obviously, during my day job, I'm doing my usual lawyering. But, I, but the forum has given me a chance to sort of give back to the community, right. which is I can give the same sort of advice um, that I give to the, uh, what are the participants of the forum? What are the uh, companies called? Uh, uh, the startups. The sponsors, the startups, the, startups, the emerging startups. companies. Right, so I get a chance to, to sort of um, help the community. What is it, pay forward? There must be some expression. There, there is an expression. Right, we'll, we'll but I get to do that as a, as a member of the community, and I've been doing that for 20 years while doing my patent work during the daytime. Um, in the evening as I can help here. And I, I met you through the uh, one of the special interest groups. That's right. We used to run podcasts. We used to run monthly programs. And now as you've joined the board and started running the um, Connect the Things, Things Conference, right. which this is part of, um, I've had the opportunity to help out. Uh, and uh, so I believe the second panel I've run, and I've loved it. Uh, second or third for, for this. Yeah. For, for the, uh, the, the video ones. And, oh, you're right. Uh, and uh, you also went to MIT at some point. I went to school here. I went to have a physics degree here back in the, uh, I think it was in the BC era. No, I'm yes. sorry. The Stone Ages. But, um, I'm so not sure if they even had years back then. They might not have, yes. They were just, uh, it we'll was just say, It was before 2000. Yes. <laughs> it was articulated in a different manner. Yeah. People <laughs> carved them in. That's right. So, That's right. so anyway, so a little background on your moderator there. Um, I, I, again, I want to thank everybody for participating. Absolutely. I want to thank the the Neurala team and also Bob Lampkin, correct, who yep. brought them in for uh, for helping us uh, build out a, a great session. That's and Max Versace and uh, Heather Ames. Yeah, that's from, right from uh, from Neurala, Neurala. Uh, Boston area company. So, thank you everybody yeah. for for participating. Thanks for joining us.